picture it, if you will. All the disciples are gathered for worship. They've brought some bread, some wine, maybe some olives and smoked fish. They begin this simple, intimate worship service. One of them reads from the Hebrew Scriptures. Another offers a meditation. They sing from the book of Psalms. Then they share in this communal meal. And suddenly, a violent rush of wind, tornadoes through the room, and they try to communicate what is happening only to discover they're all speaking in different languages. And the commotion in this house where the disciples are, are gathered is so loud that it, it quickly draws the attention of passers-by. And as this crowd gathers to see what is happening, they're amazed. What does this mean? And others say, fake news, they're drunk. Well, in defense, Peter jumps up and, and says something to the effect of, hey, we're not drunk, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning, as if, you know, there's some sort of demarcation of time <laughs> that can determine when a person can be drunk. It's not the wine, we're full of the Spirit. In the two millennia that have passed, since this outpouring of the Holy Spirit on that first day of Pentecost, Christians have associated this day with the beginning of Christianity as its own distinct religion. The experience of God doing a profoundly new thing. But in the time of the first Christian Pentecost, it was already an ancient Jewish holiday. It was an agricultural feast. The end of the barley harvest and the start of the wheat harvest. A celebration of thanksgiving for another year of blessings for a successful gathering in and a prayer for the harvest to come. So they had a festival, their own version of Thanksgiving. Fifty days after Passover, it was also a time of uh, when they would come together to commemorate the giving of the law in Sinai and to celebrate their escape as slaves in Egypt. So that helps explain the accusation that the disciples were drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. The pastors by just assumed these guys were you know, either getting a head start <laughs> or they were still at it from the night before. You can be pretty sure that if there's any accusations of drunken behavior here at First Federated, we're going to make the news tonight. A mighty wind or tons of flame fulfilled prophecies, they make for good stories. But miraculous transformations just don't happen anymore, right? I mean, the people who lived in that time, they, you know, they weren't as sophisticated as we are today. Oh, they certainly didn't face the same pressures that we face. Of course they did. And with the disadvantage of bucking the Jewish authorities and the risk of incurring Roman wrath. Just as they were 2,000 years ago, people are still crying out for deliverance from something. Delivery from war-torn homelands and refugee camps, delivery from isolation, delivery from racism and bigotry. Everywhere we look, people are imprisoned, 
physically, mentally, emotionally. Behind walls of depression and loneliness, addiction, shackled with burdens of financial debt, wrestling with the unrealistic expectations of having it all, of having to choose between doing what one believes is spiritually right and what we do to keep our status in the community. To this year's graduating confirmation class, Alyssa, Christian, Megan, Hunter, Alisa, and Jimmy, as the newest members of our congregation, we welcome you into this adult world of mixed emotions. <laughs> and you thought we had it all figured out, didn't you? <laughs> you probably thought that we have been spending all of our grown-up time making the world a better place and smoothing out the road for you. Well, we meant to, but we've left some work for you to do too. Just as your confirmation next week will mark an affirmation of your baptism, it also marks in this place and time, your decision to publicly declare your belief in God and the teachings of Jesus Christ. It does not mean you are done learning. Hopefully it does not mean you are done asking questions. Indeed, it does not mean that you no longer have doubts about God or your purpose in this world. You are going to have plenty of times when you will ask like any three-year-old why. And sometimes in exasperation, you will find yourself asking, what does it all mean? Your confirmation gives all of us hope. Because you represent for us a new beginning. Pentecost represents such a thing. Jesus promised us the Holy Spirit. The celebration of the inspiration of the Spirit is not limited to today. The Spirit can inspire us to new things at any time. Five years ago already, Alexis was inspired to put together a car show to help support our food pantry, Mother Hubbard's Cupboard. And when the short family moved away, it didn't mean the car show had to end. It inspired Christina to take on the challenge of organizing a great event that not only feeds the hungry, but brings us together and helps introduce who we are to others who might be searching for a community of believers that don't believe we have everything all figured out. Two years ago, if you'd have said we would be helping refugees, I would have laughed. I mean, where is the connection? Why wouldn't we? And then last year, the Holy Spirit told my son Evan to share an article from the Toledo Blade newspaper with me about the resettlement agency, Us Together. And the result was a spirit-filled trip to meet Syrian families and to share your gifts with them. And now, 
the Youngstown Diocese is gearing up for a similar effort here in Youngstown beginning in October. Of course, when someone shared that information on Facebook, local users blew it up with all kinds of hate. One person said, and I'm quoting, I'm sorry, I do feel bad, but Jesus, we have enough going on right here in the U.S. We need to take care of our own for once. The pastor in me couldn't let it go. <laughs> I had to respond. So I said, I, and I quote, Did you just hear yourself invoke the name of Jesus? You know he was a real guy, right? Muslims, Jews, and Christians acknowledge that. And he had plenty to tell us in Matthew 25. I invite you to check it out and feel a sense of call. Another user also said, and I quote, can't take care of our own. That's a pretty big theme, by the way. To which I couldn't help but responding, and the man asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? I'm sorry, sometimes I open my brain and a snarky just jumps right out. All the stuff in this book, it's more than great stories. Our confirmation class has spent the past year reading dozens of scenarios that illustrate the behavior God desires for us. The good Samaritan, the prodigal son, the woman at the well, wandering in the desert for 40 years for crying out loud. These are real things that happen in our lives. Chances are if we just sit and wait around for the Holy Spirit to send fire and wind and magical gifts, we're going to be disappointed. But if we allow ourselves to imagine what a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit might look like, just might be surprised at what you might find. Maybe it is a, a fresh outpouring of the Spirit that helps us to heal a relationship. Maybe a fresh outpouring of the Spirit inspires us to commit, commit to a ministry. Of course, we sit and wait for the same old thing to happen. We're always going to get what we ask for. But if we allow ourselves to imagine something new, something fresh, something holy, then anything is possible. The Holy Spirit will be poured out on everyone. So anybody know what time it is? It is a time of amazing opportunity. And amen to that. Amen. And what's up with your box? <laughs> <laughs>